Hello everyone, welcome one and all to this episode of Cult Potato. As always, I am your ever-faithful host, Campion, and joining me today is a good friend of mine, good co-host. He is known throughout the land as the Wizard of the Twelfth Realm of Ephesius, Master of Light and Shadow, Manipulator of Magical Delights, Devourer of Chaos, Champion of the Great Halls of Tarakas. The elves know him as Fien Yalek, the dwarves know him as Zone and Hoogstanges, and he is known in the Great North as Gasmoenus Maystar, but in this realm, he is known only as Mr. Grady Hooker. Welcome to the show. How you feeling today, buddy? You said that you needed to get the whole thing. You're like, okay, I got an intro. I just got to go get the whole thing. <laughs> I didn't expect it to be that long. I'm going to be honest. I don't know what you're talking about. How you doing today, Grady? How's, how's things shaking? You're in a um, new place. I'm- you're recording in a in a new venue so hopefully that all works out for you today yeah hopefully the audio doesn't goof us today downstairs from some people cooking dinner at the moment uh, to be got a fair, lovely christmas tree as well although to be fair i'm not record i'm not editing this so it doesn't bother me in the slightest i'd love it the first episode was like me mocking you about what you need to leave in the edit and somehow i ended up editing this and now oh. i'm like mocking myself I feel the need to point out that you insisted on doing it. I was just like, no, no, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then a couple of weeks later, you're like, actually, I'm doing it now. <laughs> Send <Sitting laughs> your audio. <laughs> Look, I like editing, what can I say? Uh, but at least that makes one of us. And it is absolutely sweltering here, of course, living in the Southern Hemisphere. It is, a, it is in the middle of summer for us. It is. And our entire country is just one colossal swamp. So it is humid and disgusting, and I hate it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not the most fun of places, but I can say that there is definitely a lot less trash piled up than uh, than there will be in 2051, I think it was, 2056, somewhere around there. Oh, way further than, like, 20, uh, 25. It was 500 years, sorry. Yeah, yeah 500 years, not, not like 50 years. <laughs> Look, I was off by a factor of 100, it's fine. I was trying to do a segue. I know, I know. It, it would have worked if you would actually remembered what year the film actually took place in. If I knew it was thr- 500 years later and my math just failed me. Yeah, well, I mean, 50, 500, eh, there's, there, there's like one digit of difference there. It's practically right next to it. <laughs> and why are we talking about 500 years in the future, Grady? Because this week our movie was Idiocracy from 2006... Uh, oh wait no no sorry it takes place in 2005 you're right no forgive me forgive me don't don't you goof me take that out of the edit edit that out keeping that in um all about uh luke wilson heading into the future with his hooker friend and the world turning to shit (laughs) uh yes uh during as Grady said, released in 2005, directed by Mike Judge, uh, famous for uh, a couple of very well-known TV shows, such as Beavis and Butthead uh, and uh, King of the Hill. Uh, was he was he also involved in Daria? Because I know that was a spinoff of Beavis and Butthead, but I don't know if he actually, like, had I a I don't believe so. Role. Yeah, I don't think so, because whenever they talk about Daria, it's he never comes... Mike Judge never comes up in the conversation, so I can only assume it was like a network spinoff and someone else handled it. Yeah, I got uh, his IMDb up, he was not a part of it. Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so anyway, uh, this was made in Mike, uh, this was made by Mike Judge. Uh, it is, as Grady said, a science fiction dystopia film. First off, Grady, because uh, out of the two of us, I believe I was the only one who had actually seen it before, before doing the podcast. Yeah, that is a correct statement. I had zero clue going into this. All I got told is that they watered their plants with Gatorade, and that's it. That's whoa, everything whoa, I knew about this don't movie. You, don't you mean Brondo, the thirst mutilator? Look. It's got electrolytes, it Gatorade. It's what plants crave. I swear to God, when we were watching <laughs> that film, I said, if one more person says it's what plants crave, I'm turning the movie off, and they said it again. <laughs> And I paused that movie, and I had to take a walk around. I had to chill down, and then I could finish watching the movie. <laughs> oh, I, I, I honestly love that scene. Like, oh, it's got electrolytes. It has been like an enduring thing that I have never quite forgotten. I remember back when me and a couple of buddies back in high school first saw it. Like, it's got electrolytes. It was was 
was was a common reoccurring like personal meme especially when we were in like the grocery store and you know we'd see like the sports drinks it's like oh look it's got electrolytes yeah that, that's what plants crave i will never not I, find that funny <laughs> if i could never hear that again in my life i would be a happy man yeah and to be honest, I, while watching this, I, I ended up Googling, because I'm like, actually, what are electrolytes? And, and as I was Googling <laughs> it, I, I'm just like, oh, wait, this is exactly what I did the last time I watched this. Campion, they are literally salt to the earth. <laughs> yeah, it turns out it's, it's literally just a chemical that carries an electrical charge, which is like, a lot of, it's a lot of chemicals that do that, so... Like salt, um, that's literally what salt is. Yeah, they they were watering their plants with salt water. It was <laughs> never going to work out well. No. Uh, but, okay, Granny. So, I gotta ask you... First time watching it, before we get into what the film is actually about, I just want to know, what was your initial impression of this film? Um, I, I laughed. I enjoyed the film. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I'd watch it again. Um, some stuff definitely felt like, like, product of its timey kind of stuff. Like, yeah. early 2000s. Um, which I was not prepared coming into <laughs> this movie. They use a lot of language that would not fly nowadays. I'm like, wow, that is... Yep, that's 2005. You couldn't get away with that. Yeah, like... I, I noticed when the movie came up and started and everything, it was rated R, and I was mm-hmm. like, okay, the the first rated R one, I think, that we've done um, on this one, cool. And then, I think it's maybe five minutes into the movie, they drop a hard R. Yeah. And you're like, okay, okay then. And then just a lot of slurs. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically <laughs> two that I will not repeat, yeah. uh, just although, being churned. Yeah, although to be fair... A lot of this is supposed to depict, like, a future where everyone is dumb and stupid and horrible. So, yeah. you could make... You could make a, that in the context of the film, a lot of that language being used, could you could say that, oh, that's just to highlight how terrible everyone is in the future. I guess. If, if you want to try and, and make excuses for... It, it would have been perfectly fine in 2006. Like, I don't think... Like, 2006, while well, we still would have been... At school, intermediate primary. school. That would have been, yeah, that would have been primary, primary intermediate um, school. To be fair, even through our high school period, those those terms were still being dropped left, right, and center. Um, <laughs> yeah, by a majority I, that, of people. That stuff didn't stop being dropped until well into adulthood, and even then. <laughs> so, you know, two thousand six. I'm not surprised. Um, as you say, it is it is used by the uh, not kind people in the movies um but it's just a bit of a shock value when you're not expecting it or you didn't come into the movie preparing to be hit by these constantly yeah yeah uh but 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 aside let's let's put that to one side aside from that how did you find it (laughs) aside from that i felt like um it was it was a decent little movie Mm. it felt like maybe it repeated the same jokes over and over like it was that kind of humor yeah. Of like, we have a joke and we are going to beat it like a dead horse. Um, and whether that be, you know, every single store becoming an adult store or um, whether it's Frito or anything like that, the jokes don't hit you once. They do come back. Um, and it's that sort of dumb movie, I think. Uh, one of my girlfriends described it as, I would have so much more fun if I got drunk and then we watched this film. <laughs> Or conversely, maybe you'd have more fun if you had actually watched it back when you were a teenager. Like I did. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like it would have definitely suited both that time and that sort of, I guess, period of my life. Mm. Um, like, but it wasn't bad. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, that that's the thing with Mike Judge. He does... He tends to put out some, like, some pretty solid work. Although, to be fair, I have never met another human being that enjoys King of the Hill. I know it has a fan base. I know a lot of people really like it. I just never met any of them. Because as far as yeah. I'm aware, I don't think you're not a fan of the show, are you? No, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Beavis and Butthead or uh, King of the Hill. I've seen a few episodes here and there of both of them, and they're not necessarily my go-tos. Yeah. Like, uh, Beavis and Butthead, I can't really stand. 
Uh, and King of the Hill, I absolutely love. Although, to be fair, that's the exact opposite of what Beavis and Butthead is supposed to be. Mm. Um, but, no, the, the film was fine. Um, there were some, some really good parts in it, and then there were some other parts which mostly just made you go, like, Ugh, uh, <laughs> more than, like, this was bad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, like, the the whole... Brondo, the thirst mutilator, it's got electrolytes, which is what plants crave. That's, to this day, still really goddamn funny to me. I will never not find that funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is a bunch, like, the ending of the film as well. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about it now, but, like, uh, specifically the joke at the end was was a good joke. I liked it. Um, yeah. the, the opening sequence like explaining the concept of the film which i don't know if we've done yet um of basically just well, why, did, why did you do it now <laughs> dumb people procreate mm-hmm. and smarter people focused on their careers and didn't have children yeah um and they sort of show that by this like uptight couple uh going through life and then like redneck uh trailer park sort of family and the family tree just grows and grows and grows and grows. Yeah. Uh, and the very first note that I've written down for this movie is just, that family tree is so white. <laughs> hey, in that family tree, there is like a donkey, a chimpanzee, and Hank Hill himself. So it's not, you know, there's some variation in there. <laughs> yeah. I think George um, Bush is also in there somewhere as well. It's entirely possible. that That's like your opening uh tone to the movie like if if you laugh at that joke and and you find that sequence funny you're probably gonna like the rest of the movie if you are stone-faced and like why is this funny during that section you should probably turn it off (laughs) yeah yeah because like uh the have we explained the film premise in in whole yet or uh just what i just said then (laughs) okay it's very hot. My brain is not firing on all cylinders right now. So it, I, I, we're recording. I have to turn my fan off. It is really, really warm. So I forgive me for just blanking out there for a few <laughs> seconds. But um, I was going it's, to- it's basically that, right? Smart people procreate. Uh, sorry, smart people don't. Dumb people procreate. Yeah. Uh, we get some people. These people get frozen, put into the future. Uh, 500 years they wake up and just everybody's iqs are single digit because only the dumb people procreate yeah so it's just a future of just the absolute dumbest here like humanity is just absolutely just it's literally just trailer park trash just covering the entire planet who can barely string together a coherent sentence they can't put circle pegs in circle holes again a sequence that i that i also found really <laughs> especially the guy who's doing it and he's getting it wrong and then he tries to cover up his, the uh, what he's doing as if you know someone's actually going to cheat off him I find, yeah. I find that stuff very funny don't don't steal his wrong answer it's important <laughs> to him um but i guess if if you're talking about like the two main characters that we've got through this at least from the quote-unquote present time um just a subtle joke is like you've got your average joe yeah who is literally average and called joe yeah like literally uh like scientifically he is probably the most average human being on the face of the planet and in that way luke wilson kind of really pulls off that that average person like i could not have cared less about this character at the start he was just so uh white meat generic human yeah. Which is kind of the point. Um, and then his female counterpart, because they can't find an average Jane. Um, well, specifically just... in the in the military or in the public sector. I guess. Well, they, they found her in the private sector instead. <laughs> um, they just pick up a woman of the night and bring her down. Yeah. Pay well, her 50 can, bucks and is, shove her in a pod. It is implied the only reason that he picked her up was because... Uh, the guy, the the guy in the military running the experiment was heavily involved in, uh, like in the prostitution ring, with, with her pimp, which is pretty much the only reason she got picked for the experiment. Pimping ain't easy. No. 
Um, yeah, there's a whole subplot, obviously, around that. Um, it's kind of why the experiment explodes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and like not even a year into the experiment running, and the the guy gets busted for prostitution, and the whole thing has to be shut down, and they kind of just forget about the the people inside of the stasis pods. Uh, her name was Rita, played by SNL alumni Maya Rudolph, who's been in you know a ton of different things. A lot of things. A lot of things. That's if why I just watched said this SNL movie and you're like, alumni. She looks... because, yes, that's why I just said SNL alumni because she's been in a lot of different things. Let's let's just keep it keep it like that. You'll recognize her face mm-hmm. for sure. Um, and then I guess yeah, our main character once we get into the future, Frito um i started off not particularly liking the guy but i gotta say my second to last note on this uh notes page i wrote was just i love frito he cool (laughs) there's something there's something strangely endearing and charming about just a complete and total moron but he's he's you know he's he's chugging along doesn't always do the right thing but you know he's funny hmm uh and if we're, if we're going through cast uh our frito played by dex shepherd um if we're going by cast again knowing nothing about this movie the only casting that sort of hit me like a freight train was when the president of the united states walked in <laughs> you mean president Dwayne elizondo mountain dew herbert comancho yep i did not see that coming yeah, of course, played by Terry Crews, who is also from everything. <laughs> from everything? What a good from credit. Every, from everything. Terry Crews, from everything. Like, I, got a real, I got a real hankering to rewatch Brooklyn Nine-Nine again. Hmm. Um, and I only have so many uh, uh, uncensored... Uh, swears I can use. I'm banking them up still. We're on episode five. I've got five banked up. So I'm not going to say the name of a lot of stores they run through. I'm pretty this, sure the uh, person who said the most of the swears in this has been me. You said two in the first episode because I had to go bleep them. And since then we've been clean. <laughs> uh, but there's there's a lot of like uh, word jokes like uh but effers will just be posted across the side as like a store name like they don't shy away it, it from that it's definitely like a rated re-ba- r a rebranding of fud ruckers which i turns out is an actual an actual chain of restaurants mm-hmm. in the u.s i had no idea that was a real place i always just assumed it was like a joke from idiocracy but no fud ruckers is an actual place yep um and there's just a lot like that like there's a reason this movie's rated r <laughs> Um, and I only have one request coming out of this movie, and that is, can we watch Ass next for the podcast? Is that our next cult classic? Oh, is it though? Because I feel like that's a widely beloved and incredibly, like, commercially successful film. I mean, it won yeah, like eight Oscars. That cinema was full. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Although, to be fair, I remember, I don't know if this is real or not, but I do remember a story from years back of how a guy did genuinely just show like an hour and a half long or maybe it was just like 45 minutes just like a, f- a full film of just someone's ass in a movie theater it's like a i group wouldn't of be surprised patrons. although and apparently people actually did genuinely start bursting out into laughter i think that because it was just so absurd that mm people just kind of didn't know how to respond and so once one person started laughing everyone just started laughing yeah yeah look i'm not gonna suggest we go watch ass (laughs) maybe um hey absurdist comedy is always fantastic i'm pretty sure we got a couple on the list so um we will we will get there again has to be a cult classic if it's if it's won eight Oscars, I don't think it can, you know... I don't know if it really qualifies. <laughs> well, Campion, what other than Electrolytes did you like about this film? Because obviously you came into this knowing the film, you came into yeah. this uh, and rewatched it, so what did you catch? Oh, there's... A lot of it... It's not a lot of big things, it's just like a lot of... Because while you're right, it does hammer some of the jokes home just a bit too many times. 
there are a bunch of times in there it's just a lot of like really little just really clever lines in there like uh again the whole brondo exchange is still really funny to me um the scene where he gets out of prison by just going up to the guard and saying hey i'm not supposed to be in prison and then they just let him go uh (laughs) the scene you know how he keeps how he's made the secretary of the interior and he just has and no one has any idea what that position actually means um that quick shot of where it shows like the washington monument with a reflecting pole and there's a bunch of speedboats and stuff all inside of it and it's leaning to one side just a lot of little things like that just which is really funny to me yeah i definitely agree that this movie is just a bunch of little things tied together uh some of which are those little things as we say uh repeated or hammered home but generally they're funny and i guess when they're those little things like that if one misses wait three seconds because another one's gonna hit you yeah. or even uh like oh like the bit where they're going into costco and the great is just like welcome to costco i love you and like a completely deadpan monotone Nick, <laughs> that's just little things like that oh oh wait there was a there was one bit where they slammed carl's jr i can't remember what it was <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of that carl's jr bought a baby because a woman didn't get her fries properly out of the vending machine <laughs> and like it just tried to charge her again she had no money it called her an unfit parent and then carl's jr seized ownership of her baby yeah. like corporations did not get off well in this movie no and oh the, the scene where it's just like man, I could really go for a Starbucks, and without missing a beat, Frito's just like, yeah, but, yeah, me too, but I don't really know if we, I don't really know if we have time for a hand job right now. Just, stuff like that. Really goddamn clever. Yeah, that you could tell when they went into Mega Costco, which first off is an awesome concept, other than the fact that it takes days to travel around. Um, is just like every single fast food store has just been remade into an adult store. Whether it be Starbucks or whether it be something else. Like uh, t- Carl's what Jr. What was it, like a tax accountancy as well? It was like adult yeah, there was an tax, adult tax accountancy. On. There was just a lot of that. Um, which I, I guess when everybody's got single digit IQs, that's kind of the businesses that'll flourish, right? Like uh, one of the one of the president's, pre- president's uh, cabinet members won their job in a contest. Mm-hmm. And it's a child. And it's a child, yeah. Um, yeah, it is really just a series of small jokes. And that's why, you know, when we're trying to talk about it, we can't say, like, this is our definite favorite scene or this is our definite favorite part because they were just hitting you left, right, and center with stuff. Yeah. And and it, it surprises me just how many of, like, these immature and dumb jokes that I still find really funny because some of them are really clever and smart. But they mix it with, like, a lot of, like, the because this is a future where everyone is just really immature and stupid. So, of course, you know, they get a lot of, they're able to milk a lot of immature and dumb jokes out of it. Like, the scene where um he has to do that monster truck fight for his rehabilitation. And then his mm-hmm. car pulls up and it's got that big purple dildo flo- uh, flopping on the front. Still got a chuckle out of me. Didn't think it would. Thought I was more, thought I'd, you know, grown up in the decades since I've seen this. But no still after that i'm still that's that still gets me look some things never change um you know i guess to to move off of the the jokey portion just because i have one more i guess serious note that i've taken um was that i'm gonna hope that it was like a statement um there was like two notable female characters in the entire film uh, and even if you include the like non-notables, they were either all sex workers, including Rita, or in the president's cabinetcy, but just because she has big tits. <laughs> and like that is it for females in this film. Yeah. Um, and it was pretty noticeable. Like even just crowd shots, even all the crowd shots were just dudes, just nothing but dudes. Yeah. Although to be f- yeah, although to be fair, the, the, fil- the crowd scenes are filled with dudes, but most of them are fat and disgusting. Yeah, it's that's why I, I'm sort of assuming that it was a statement piece done on purpose. Like, you had to go out of your way to not put 
females and things like crowd shots or even as just bit parts around the place like there was none working as like the cops or at the prison or anything like that so yeah. it's got to be on purpose like i remember there was like a there was like a new a news anchor and reporter hmm. a couple of those um i think there was a rece- the receptionist as well working at the the hospital in the beginning yeah a few bit pieces here and there but you know uh it is what it is it's also 2006 so Maybe it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> I I do feel that, like, uh, some of them were. Like, uh, how a lot of the women are prostitutes, or how um, the only reason there's a woman in the president's cabinet is because she has big tits. I feel that's... That kind Those of stuff... Be. Yeah, that's definitely on. On purpose. By the way, just... Because uh, I went ahead and Googled this, just back to Carl's Jr. for a brief moment here, because <laughs> I was trying to remember what their slogan in the future was. It was, Carl's Jr. Thank you, I'm eating nice I don't, I don't i don't know why they don't actually just use that because that would actually be pretty great <laughs> um only the third third swear usage in cold potato so far episode six made it far I enough feel, i have a feeling episode we've five, way sorry. more than that in previous ones i feel like we've heard way nah. more than that especially Look, in the last as i get through and edit them we'll figure it out <laughs> yeah i feel like in the last one we did i did way more most of them have been from me you are you are not wrong I still work in radio. (laughs) (laughs) I still have my turn on the radio filter button. I don't know. Dude, I abandoned that years ago. Yeah. Um, And then just another character I want to hit on, um, because it's going to lead into a bit of trivia that I didn't realize at the time, but uh, Beef Supreme. Mm -hmm. Great character. (laughs) Um, Didn't say a single line just pointed campion why did he just point uh, oh yeah like the scene where they're doing like the whole rehabilitation dist- uh destruction derby like demolition derby sorry mm. and he's you know pointing he's like oh did he go this way and the guy's just like no he's over there he's over there and everyone's getting really into it like it's this bit like like an episode of dora the explorer or something <laughs> like that or even the announcer's getting into it where he's just like oh no he's behind the truck stupid I- it- it's another it's another great scene but Sorry, you said you said you had some trivia about that. Yeah, I didn't notice this as I was watching the film, um, but the main character is Owen Wilson's brother, Luke Wilson. You did, you didn't know Luke Wilson was Owen Wilson's brother. Nope. Did not have any idea. And then Andrew <laughs> Wilson, Beef Beef Supreme, yeah. also his brother. Yeah. Yes. Now, so this is the reason... We get two Wilson brothers in this movie. The reason I learned, and at the same time, Owen Wilson was voicing Lightning McQueen in Cars, so you can figure out whose career went better. Um, <laughs> this was, like, just after Owen Wilson had his, his big mental health problems. Um, and so, Andrew Wilson was actually sort of like, no, I'm out of it, I'm not doing films, go away. Because he didn't really support, especially the Screen Actors Guild, um who didn't really help out owen during those times and sort of just left him to wallow and and to take the path that he ended up taking um luke asked him really nicely and he agreed to do it but did not want to say a word because then he didn't have to get his sag card and he could just do the part so that's why beef supreme never says a word is because andrew wilson didn't want to be a sag uh member oh well, fair enough. And to be fair, him not saying a word does work really well for the movie, so... It did. That made the Beef Supreme character pretty good. I'd rank him as, as number number five character. Yeah. Number one, of course, being President Dwayne Elizondo, Mountain Dew Herbert, Command Show. Of course. You can't beat that. Can't beat Terry Crews with the full head of hair. 20 time. Uh, I like how he's like the 20 time like smackdown champion oh sorry ultimate smackdown champion <laughs> it's probably how he won the presidency to be fair <laughs> what at, at, at ultimate wrestlemania yeah ultimate wrestlemania main event presidency on the line <laughs> don't give vince any ideas you know he'll do it he will he will i don't yeah or is that maybe he's doing it right now maybe that's what the golden egg's all about Dun, dun, dun. I don't um, know. I don't, I, I don't know. The golden egg got resolved. You're fine. 
<laughs> also, by the time I edit this and put it out, this thing's not coming out for like four months. That's going to be dated <laughs> meme. It's going to be super dated. I don't know. I don't know if Golden Egg's ever going to go out of style. I'm always going to find that funny. So at the very least, I will find my own dumb joke funny. That's fair. Um, and I guess fast forwarding towards like the end of the movie as well. Um, I, I sort of slightly mentioned it that I really loved the ending joke. Like you knew something was happening. You knew yeah. that Joe wasn't getting on a time machine and going back in time. You really knew that. But yeah. I didn't expect that joke at the end. <laughs> uh, you mean the joke where uh, it turns out that it's just a ride and they're having to go through. Which, by the way, the time machine uh, ride, like Disneyland-esque ride, is, also, is probably one of... Okay, that's my second favorite like like joke in the whole film <laughs> next to you know Brondo the thirst meter later it's a but it's a really good joke it's really good like the part where he's just like yes but then came along the un you know instead of the un yeah i didn't think i would still find that funny just pronouncing un as un didn't think i would still find it funny i still found it funny grady i still thought it was really funny it's because secretly inside you're still 14 year old campion Although, although saying that World War Two happened when the USA got its dinosaur to fight the Nazis' dinosaur, that, that's that's also still really funny. I as soon as like it was on there and it seemed like it was going to be like a, it's a small world kind of ride, I was very interested in seeing what sort of alternate history got pre- <laughs> presented, and yeah, they they nail the alternate uh, history stuff pretty well. Yeah. Like Charlie Chaplin as Hitler is always is always a classic. Um, and yeah, obviously everybody ends up staying around in the future. Cause I, I feel like this is a way better ending than if they'd ever gone back. Like yeah. that would have almost been unsatisfying if they'd gone back. Like a bit of a, like a bit of a cop out or something. Hmm. Um, and I, I guess another running joke that came really important towards the end of the film was Rita claiming that she was an artist and that her <laughs> pimp was selling her art um and like the entire way through the film joe's like yeah just keep doing your art we need more people in the arts um that's just another one of those recurring ones and then you see her at the end trying to you know paint her joe you know they've gotten married she's trying to paint him and it's this terrible crappy little (laughs) little uh child like a painting that you would ex- like a watercolor painting you would expect a child to do but you know what she's giving it a go she seems to be enjoying herself so i'm not gonna knock her for it it's probably better than any painting i could do fair enough fair enough yeah so it's it's i feel like it's winding down now so grady any i don't know any further thoughts on this film like anything you think we've even covered so far or just anything you wanted to to kind of say on it um weirdly i was gonna ask you uh the same question you got in slightly before me um i could tell it was coming so i'm like oh i gotta he really gotta slip it in before he can do it if he pops it in then i have to do the hard part and if i slip it in then he has to do the hard part but <laughs> hey whatever i'll go through my notes um the pods they got into uh one of my girlfriends i was watching it with mentioned that they look way too much like the avatar pods uh but if they were made at like a two dollar store um and i wrote that gatorade is still better than water uh even though i've never drunk gatorade in my life i feel like gatorade is exactly the same as every other sports drink on the market i will be i would be it's just colored green i would be genuinely surprised if there was any like massive difference between like gatorade and powerade in fact i would not be surprised if they just repackaged the same formula as a different product how could they do that though because because gatorade has electrolytes no it's Br- it's brondo that has electrolytes grady they all have electrolytes that's the entire point of a sports drink <laughs> um, which is just which is just salt it's just salt man <laughs> it's just salt <laughs> I don't know, maybe they put magnes- little bits of magnesium or potassium or something. Yeah, let's catch people on fire. You know, potassium, that thing that's in, like, bananas. <laughs> it's a different <laughs> form. Yeah. 
Um, is sugar an electrolyte? I feel like it is. I don't know if sugar is conductive, but maybe. Actually, that's true. That's glucose. That's a different. That's a different thing. But... Look, let's stop trying to be scientists and instead, Campion. What was your opinion? What What else do you think we haven't touched on in the film? You and your not running on all cylinders brain. <laughs> um. I, even after all these years, I still like it's a, feel like it's a very solid movie. Although, admittedly, I was a, you know, back back as a weird little campaign when I was much when I was much more high on myself and a bit and a lot more pretentious than I am now. I know campaign at one point campaign was more pretentious when I Impossible. thought that this was like an actual like genuinely you know deep commentary on where society is going. That I rewatch it, I'm like. Actually, nah. They just they just kind of want to shit on corporations and stuff for an hour and a half. <laughs> I I don't think this is trying to spread any sort of you know intense message or uh, genuine satire on where the human race is going to go. Who knows? We could be heading here. Yeah, it's it's just uh, I don't know. Like after watching for like a decade and a half on, it's just like eh, actually I don't know if we're getting any dumber. I just think humanity has always been at a baseline kind of moron i think that's just how we've done things evolution takes a lot longer than 500 years yeah and uh, because i was i was studying like child psychology and stuff environment also plays heavily into it there's a lot of factors now that and the baseline iq is has actually actually increases year to year like the global iq has been going up so they actually need to increase the average IQ score and stuff, so, yeah. So what you're telling me is that I will never meet someone as stupid as Frito. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've met some pretty dumb people <laughs> in my lifetime. And, and to be honest, Mike Judge himself she actually shared that exact sentiment. He was like, actually, that, that wasn't really... Well, the, it, it was a bit of a satire, but that wasn't... You know, we didn't really weren't trying to say... That's where humanity was trying to go. And then the 2016 presidential election happened. And then he's just like, well, actually, you know, maybe. Maybe. He, he, may, he may have changed his tune after that. And we will not be going there because I feel that that's a, that's a conversation that neither of us really all that qualified to go into. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Grady has this big political hot take he, he wants to throw at us actually i guarantee you that's exactly what he has go on grady let, let's hear your view on the on the 2016 american presidential election i'll dust off my degree in political science and i'll just say that uh candidate camacho should have won <laughs> oh, he would have he would have been a lot better for the country Although the bit where he's giving his presidential speech and then he's pulling out like a machine gun every few seconds to fire into the roof if the actual president president did that, I would I would be, you know, I would be on board for that kind of stuff. Um, look, we've we've got enough wrestlers who are pretending to be presidents. We don't need uh, <laughs> uh, President Camacho to come along either. But um, no, nah, we need more. We need we more. <laughs> when I can more. have a WrestleMania of entirely just former presidents, that's that's when we've got enough. Don't lie, Grady. That would be amazing. It wouldn't. Um, Hey, I, we already had a former WWE Hall of Famer as a as the president. We could use a few more. I'm gonna start doing that thing where I ad lib for like two minutes while you pull up facts about the movie to wrap up the episode with. <laughs> um, so there was like looking at this cast list, or at least the the small piece of the cast list. If I'm looking at you know who's the most famous coming off of this, ignoring sort of uh maya rudolph or terry cruz i'm looking at like bit parts and you've got like your justin long uh who was in there for like a minute in one scene um or patrick fischler who was in that opening scene i talked about where he was like the smart uh dude and the couple yeah um those two are probably two of the more famous people coming out of that yeah. other than other than terry cruz and uh, maya tom kenny a very prolific voice actor who has been in no exaggeration probably every every english voice role in existence <laughs> uh he played a lot of like the machine voiceovers and a lot of, like the warning uh things uh he played the carl's jr uh vending machine he he voiced a lot of the the machines in this in this movie yeah he's done roles like okay the most famous he's the voice of spongebob and spyro 
Yeah. Yeah, it, literally it one of the most privileged. And he's he's voiced pretty much ev- in he's voiced a lot of different things. He's one of the most pro- prolific voice actors around. I'm pretty sure if you get him and Steve Blum, between the two of them, you could trace. I'm pretty sure they've had a role in every production, like voice role. Well, they've had a voice role in every production on the face of planet Earth. But neither of them were Alvin the Chipmunk. That's Al Justin Long, hundred percent. Let's go, my boy. <laughs> You're saying that, but I'm I'm thinking I I would not be surprised if Tom Kenny has had a role, or, or Al Steve Blum has had a role in some Alvin and the Chipmunk production across the years. It's entirely possible, but Campion, I've delayed long enough. Where are those hard facts you got to wrap us up? <laughs> okay, so uh, like many of the other cult classics we talk about on this show, uh, on release did not do very well although unlike a lot of the other things we've talked about it's because the studio was actively working to to sort of screw this movie over uh it had a budget of 25 million which by the way i was surprised for the amount of effects and stuff that this film required genuinely surprised the film the budget was that low hmm. like rewatching it nowadays you can kind of tell that a lot of there's a lot of matte paintings and there's a lot of green screen work in it but I think for 2005, a lot of it's done pretty well. But but anyway, 25 million. Fairly low budget for a film like this. However, it only made it made just under $500,000 back at the box office. That's not a lot. No. That's a tiny that's amount. Be- that is very tiny. In fact, uh, it was only released in 12 theaters across the America on its release day. Um... I also saw that eventually, uh, like, one number I saw is that eventually it managed to get up to 135 theatres. And I think that was worldwide. So, it it really did not do very well. Uh, the executives at Fox, the people who distributed this, they were, they were, you know, pretty, they were pretty high on the film when it was greenlit, but then as the film kept going and they saw that they were really, you know, shitting on corporations, uh, the... And potential sponsors really wanted to point out, but really wanted to pull out, but because of the contract that they'd all written, they really couldn't. So Fox was just trying to get this... They were trying to get this out of circulation as quickly as humanly possible. Mm-hmm. And the the 12 theaters, that was the absolute minimum number that they that they had to do to fulfill their contractual obligation. Because in the contract, it said this had to have a, uh, a theatrical release, and that was the absolute bare minimum that it got uh and in fact it did become a cult classic once it was released on dvd and it started getting into more hands although even then i still don't think it did very well the only number i could really find was like nine million (laughs) so not even enough to recoup the budget on that uh it didn't get any advertising whatsoever uh and it didn't even get like a pre-screening for critics so like there was nothing like no advertising whatsoever going into this film except for one one piece of advertising they did release a promotional drink for brondo that was an actual <laughs> thing that they did the only piece of advertising that they did was release bronze some brondo nice so yes we did actually get a real life physical version of the thirst mutilator and i'm just gonna double check because last time i checked well, this was ages ago. It did have a website. I'm just trying to see if I can actually find it or if it's still up. I'll make elevator okay. music. Oh, there are some fans that are still making Brondo. Hey, there's um, I think it's like a fan site for Omni Consumer Products, the com the company from Robocop. And one of their listed products is on here is Brondo. So there you go. So there you go. So you can. I think they may have actually just bought the license to sell Bros, actual Brondo. So there you go. If you want to have a bit some uh, some thirst mutilation for your plants to get those electrolytes that they crave, there you go. I just about hung up on you there. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <Yeah. laughs> Why would you do that, Grady? Don't you want to? Is it, is it because I'm talking about what plants truly crave? The best part is I can just mute you in the edit. <laughs> I can just have you, so I'm talking to myself here. 
again i will never find that not funny that is still gonna be funny to me and i'll never be able to properly articulate why fair um but you you knew this movie coming into it we're gonna we're gonna flip the table around because coming into next episode it's a movie i've seen and you haven't yes what is that film grading uh that is assassination nation uh 2018 one of our newest films uh whether you want to class it as a cult classic or not doesn't matter because i do it was the royal you it is such a subjective term does not matter it'll just be whatever we feel like i guarantee Uh, you one day we're gonna be like we're gonna be covering this uh this this you know this little known cult classic uh so great what do you think of star wars episode four a new hope (laughs) uh yeah we will get there i'm sure we'll run out of actual cult classics and the budgets will just start going up and up and the box offices will just start going up and up but uh for now anyway the god the godfather misunderstood classic what do you think look i'm I'm trying to get us to the end here (laughs) the finish line's in sight you can almost turn your fan back on and here i am just just dragging us down just just as we stumble our way to the finish line but i think it's i think we've i think we've more than reached the finish line by now so thank you everyone for joining us today here on cult potato thank you grady for for sitting with in with me so we could talk about idiocracy uh looking forward to talking about assassination nation next time so as always i am campion joined by my good buddy grady this has been the lexicon of law and we hope to see you all next time